Hello, this is James Nutt, and this is a video of the North Star Water Media Society October 2020 a watercolor demo that I was very honored to do. Um, we went through this and produced, it's about an hour and a half talk, um, and we produced uh, three images uh, in my backyard with, um, so this is one image, um, spent a little bit more time on this one. Uh, we also did a warm-up sketch beforehand and then uh, produced a smaller, looser sketch with a slightly different technique for that. And all of that was done here in my backyard. Uh, videos, one take, um, one shot. And so with that, um, what I want to do is uh, explain the video. Um, I hit record on the Zoom a little bit late into my introduction. And then you'll, see, you'll hear a talk. Um, before the pre-recorded video, and then we'll play the pre-recorded video, and then a lot of great questions from the audience. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Abstract to illustration, but always with an emphasis on relationships and storytelling. In his demo, James will do a brief introduction to his process, and then walk us through a painting filmed on site while he talks through his strategy, tools, and tips. There will be a question and answer period at the end. He will share a blog post that explains his watercolor, I'm missing a word here, his watercolor kit, brushes, and everyday tools at www.nutdraws.com. And if you haven't gone onto his website, he has a blog and lots of other things there. So if you haven't done it already, I suggest you do that um, after the demo tonight or tomorrow. And so, James, I think you can just take it away. We're ready for you. Okay, great. Um, and I did remember to hit record about halfway through your speech, but... Uh, oh, that's all right. I don't mind if I'm not on there, not one bit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, and maybe reach out to Art, see if we can help him as I get started. So anyway, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I gave a demo a few years ago. Um, and I've done the, uh, you know, the, the great show we do out at the state fair. Um, I've done a demo with that for the last two or three years. So that's, that's always really fun. Um, so what I want to do tonight is talk about what if you could, um, what if you could make a mini studio watercolor, um, studio anywhere, basically just, um, I am an architect and, uh, I'm going to give a special shout out to BWBR. They're let, letting us use their zoom account for this, so um, that was really gracious of them. But um, as an architect and as a dad and person with an old house and someone with a life balance, um, I have had to find how to squeeze art into those 15 or 20 minute segments. So a lot of my work is really fast. Once I get my kid out of the house and maybe retire and the rest of it, I'll have time for these longer, beautiful paintings that the rest of you do. Uh, but my, my thing is to Anywhere you're at, try to find the story of a place and just go for it. And that's what I'm kind of uh, hoping to do with you. Um, I, I teach. Um, I have a studio that I share at the Northwood King building. And it's actually several North Star members in that. It's the uh, Susan Fryer Voigt space. Uh, it's now been renamed. And uh, Joanne Meadow and Sabon Thurston um, run that so they're both members and I think there's one or two other members and there, there's 10 of us who share the space um, so I'll leave, give you a link to that that portion too but it's um, I do commissions um, I really love art I love talking about it I love sharing it so um, and a lot of what I do is sketchbooks I have I have piles and piles and piles and piles of sketchup sketchbooks and um, so a lot of my work is kind of short and fast like that. Um, we were setting at Duluth and I I think these were on the demo things, you know, so this, you know, so I kicked out four of these in about 30 minutes while my kid played on the rocks. Uh, sometimes they're abstract, sometimes they're more realistic. I'm just gonna grab a book, this one, who knows? This is 2013, so just on an airplane. You know, the little, the little things that you turn on to get more air. Um, this was setting at a beach place, you know, so just little things, just little things. I, I draw a lot of coffee cups. You'll see a couple uh, today. And she's in my warm up sketch. So, um, so I'll go through all that, but um, 
there's so much that I want to share in so little time. So what I did is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And give me a thumbs up if you see uh, a picture, if you start to see pictures on the screen. Can everybody see this? Um, actually, let me redo that because I need to set it up so the, um, uh, the video will show. Hold on. Let me redo this. All right. So that's good. All right. Okay, so this is the website that uh, she was talking about. And I do a little bit of everything. So this is the, at Northrop King, this is our, our front door. This was our previous, my previous studio uh, that I had completely chim packed. But a lot of my stuff is, uh, this is a small, I can't tell you on this baseball sketch, I can't tell you who won or who we're playing with, but I really can remember exactly being there doing that sketch. Uh, this is probably two beers worth of a sketch. Sometimes I say this is a coffee cup worth of a sketch. Sometimes it's a 20 minute sketch. Uh, all the way to more abstract stuff. Uh, I sketch a lot in church, like I sketch and paint, like legit in church. So some of these are small. Some of these are, some of these are this size, and some are larger. This this painting is in process, and that's my great grandfather saw. Um, and then. This is a small one that I did at uh, the State Fair. They did a little thing on my sketching at the State Fair. So I sketched that for the cameraman. And I think that's why he did a little bit better editing job than you probably would have done. So, so this gives you a sense of, of my sketches. But I also put a blog together um, about this thing I'm doing right now. So this was my setup in my backyard of how I filmed this. And then all of the paints and everything I'm going to talk about, they're all here. So these are the images that um, the finished paintings. Paintings are never finished, right? They're due. Um, so these are what you'll see made. And then I also, I talk about my sketch bag. I talk about my paints. Um, you know, so this blog has a lot to it. And it talked about my pens and, and different things like that. So like this is my studio uh, down in my basement. I do work outside. I do work in my basement. I do work at Northrop King. Um, so anyway, so so go ahead and visit this. I'll um, I'll put the links in the chat so that you can just copy clip them. But uh, on Instagram, I'm really really um, active on that because I love to teach. So when I paint live, I'll take a picture every three or four or five minutes, and that's on Facebook, uh, YouTube, and and the rest. So I'll I'll copy clip these in. Um, but like on the Instagram, I love to to post process pictures. And so I'm kind of known for these big four foot long watercolor pencils. And so sometimes I will, um, sometimes I'll do a stop motion video of how that works. Uh, so this is probably about 45 minutes taking every three seconds. So I really do love to share. Part. So and it looks like art is on. So, all right. So, so I have a lot of this on the Instagram page and you can follow a lot of the artists that you really love um, on there. So. Um, this is really fun because this is uh, Daniel Smith uh, Moonglow, and just watch that paint just moves the entire time. I just love, I love to do a rigorous sketch. As an architect, I'm really trying to keep everything in line and no surprises all day long. I love in watercolor. I set up a rigorous underlay and then just go super loose with the execution and let those accidents happen. My favorite, favorite part of watercolor. Um, I think what else I'm going to show you, um, and then. I've got a couple links to this is the this is the studio I share with other uh, North Star members, um, Susan Boyce uh, space. But here's the, the front door and um, Susan and or Saban and Joanne who are who run the who run it now. So come out and see us Sundays, 12 Saturdays, 12 to 4 um, events. So on my page, I've got the event. So with that, um, see what else is it going to tell you? So what we're going to talk about now is just catching the story of a sketch. I'm not necessarily trying to be um, super accurate. I'm just trying to be at a place and tell the story. It just occurred to me, uh, we went to Europe three or four years ago. And uh, on that trip, even with a little kid running around, you know, I got about 30 sketches. These are some, but waiting for pizza or coffee cup, you know, a coffee's worth, like this is a 30 second sketch. This is on a train. Um, this is during lunch. So just, just trying to capture these places as we go. I guess that's the advantage of uh, working from home here. So um, so with that, 
we'll go ahead time for questions and stuff at the end, but I'm gonna go ahead and start this video. And like I said, it's set up in my backyard. It's one shot, <laughs> there's no editing. Um, it just kind of is what it is what it is. When I do this, if you can hear the sound, give me a thumbs up because uh, there is a setting where that needs to needs to be set up. Um, and then I'll be able to look at the chat while we while we look at this. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is James Nutt. I'm excited to give this demo for the um, North Star Water Media Society uh, 2020. Uh, what I'm going to cover today is what if you could create a little studio anywhere and get a painting done in 20, 30 minutes. And uh, I personally do a lot of different types of drawing, painting, abstract, uh, but one of my favorite things is urban sketching. And urban sketching is basically telling the story of where you're at. Uh, quick little little pieces. We're not trying to be super realistic. We're just really trying to tell stories. So I thought I would walk you through my process here. So I've got a whole setup outside. Since we have to do this with COVID, I thought, what can we do that we couldn't do with our normal Thursday meeting? So I'm outside. I am in my backyard. I have a setup here um, where I can show you what I'm painting. I'm going to walk you through my materials. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a, since I'm here in my backyard, um, excuse me, I'll mess with the screen here. Um, we are going to do a little sketch of my backyard, as you can, you'll see here in a second. And I'll just walk you through my process of how I get things set up, how I work through, like there's a lot to draw here, right? So how do you pick, how do you choose? Um, hopefully we'll come out with a painting or two out of this. Um, and I'm going to go in two different directions. One, I'm going, I'm going to focus a little bit on drawing because that's one of the things about my art. This may be different than other watercolors. I do rely a lot on line work and pen work. Uh, I always know I can save a drawing with a pen at the end. Uh, I'm an architect by trade. Um, this is like a second job for me with the watercolor and everything. So they really do feed off of each other. Um, so with that, I am going to get this set up so that you can see me and then you can see my um, page here. So um, I carry watercolor sketchbooks with me everywhere. I probably have, I don't know, 20, 25 of these um, throughout the last eight years or so. Um, I sketch wherever I go. This is a set of keys. I was doing a building survey one day. I was just brain dead, but I felt like painting. So the keys were in front of me and I thought they looked kind of cool. Sometimes it's just abstract. Sometimes I'll draw over the top of these. Um, sometimes they're a little bit more figural. Sometimes they're more abstract. Sometimes they're notes, camera settings. Um, sometimes they're experiments. This is a walnut ink with uh, some metallic pigment in it. Um, but here recently, you know, here's, here's a study for a larger sketch, uh, larger painting. It was a commission for a, a construction company and their employees got together and commissioned a piece. For them, this is at a setting where I'm sitting now in my backyard, but sometimes they're just, sometimes they're just play. I always do a warm up sketch and typically it's a cup of coffee because I usually have one. I've got my cup of coffee here. I also have my paint water here. It's an occupational hazard, but you know, sometimes you have to take risk. Um, but more recently, I can show you another sketchbook here. Um, I'll go with materials a little bit, but I also have set up a, a blog uh, for this demo that, that shows my materials in more detail and also some of my paints. Uh, so here's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Here's a painting done in Stillwater. Uh, this was about a five minute quick sketch, um, a milkshake's worth of a sketch from, uh, Leo's here. Um, this was a this is one done a little bit earlier that day. I'm not trying to make a perfect painting, just trying to tell the story of being there in that space. Um, the lighting could be a little bit better on these. This was at Duluth a few weekends ago. Um, I did four of these sitting there in about 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, I carried two different sketchbooks with me. And it's so funny, like this one, I really this is I really like this one a lot more than the next one, but a few weeks out from it, I am more drawn uh, to this one for the same reasons I wasn't crazy about it <laughs> in the beginning. So um, that's sort of what we're going to go through today. Um, I think I have a Duluth sketch in here that was on the uh, website with the demo. I may have grabbed the wrong um, sketchbook there, but um, 
anyway we'll make our own here so um, I typically carry two sketchbooks I work on two drawings at once while one is um, you know watercolor is so dependent on how much how much water is actually in the paper and how dry it is or how dry it isn't and um, that really does make a huge huge difference so um, I'll have one that's doing its drying while I work on the other and so today what we're going to do is everybody always asks me do you do the drawing first then the ink and then the paint or you do the paint and then the ink I'm going to do that two different ways here just to show you um, it also works out timing wise it also depends on the weather right like right now uh, it's not really humid uh, there's no wind so the drying will take about the normal amount of time right if it was really windy and super hot man you can get a lot done because things dry really fast uh, if it's sort of rainy uh, sometimes you get those rain splotches and it gives you some nice surprises so you just have to um, whatever conditions you have you, you need to dance with the conditions not fight them so um, I'm like I said I'm an architect and very busy a lot of hobbies and so uh, I have found ways to make paintings in 20 or 30 minutes or it doesn't get done so um, if I've got time to paint just about anybody does but uh, everybody says I don't have a studio set up so I'll show you how to do that really quick um, I have started going back and forth between carrying sketchbooks in this bag uh, and on my blog I talk about the bags a little bit my family got me this little Bob Ross sticker for a Father's Day I love it um, kind of makes the bag um, but I've also been carrying um, pre-cut this is 300 pound just because it, it travels so well and you don't have to stretch it um, sheets and I have been using that quite a bit um, I think I lost the one I had in here but you know I cut some by five by seven and I can tuck them in the back of here uh, and then also what I've learned the hard way over the years is to before you start anything I don't know if you can see it or not but um, I measure out eight by ten five by seven standard frame sizes I have cost myself so much money not sketching to a standard size first i'm going to sketch on larger sheets and i usually do it outside just so we can see it a little bit better with the camera um, and i'll talk about drawing a little bit too so first off I'll talk about what i carry i carry this bag with me everywhere so nothing special about the bag in particular but i usually have um, i've got my pens that i carry in here several different kinds i'll talk about that um, my watercolor kit and i have gone through a whole ton of different uh, experiments of different sizes and I keep coming back to this this one um, just because the size is really great I've got old stickers on it scratched up it's been to Europe a couple times I've used this for probably six or seven years I've experimented with a ton of others uh, this is my main kit you can tell us it's about time to start um, refilling this back up um, and I'm I'm always evolving what's in my palette. Um, for right now, I'll talk about this in a minute, but I saw I steal a lot from uh, online artist uh, Liz Steele and you know, Jane Blundell and a bunch of people. They are kind enough to post uh, what they do. And like one of them had the idea of keeping the, these are both the same yellow, same yellow where you keep one and clean and you can let one get dirty. I thought that was a great idea. I've used it for a while. Um, it's actually for me, not, a, not an issue. So I'm probably gonna replace this with another color. And then I was supposed to be going to Italy this year because it was our 20 year anniversary and that's where I proposed to my wife. And we were all excited about it and I was gonna paint and paint and paint. And uh, so I was experimenting with uh, different colors that might work for that beautiful architecture there. So, um, you know, we will still go, but it, won't, it won't be this year. Uh, I also very often will use these water pens. I don't know if you've used these or not. Uh, they're fantastic for this travel sketching. I'm not going to do that uh, for this demo so I can show you a little bit more control, but uh, these are fantastic. They're cheap and they work in a pinch. Um, I have done tons and tons and tons and tons with that. Um, the problem with a bag like this, you know, here's here's some pre-cut sheets I talked about earlier. They're five by seven and they just they flip in here because when something's in a sketchbook, you have this conundrum, right? Is it part of the sketchbook? Is it separate? Do you cut it out? Um, but the more and more I frame my work, uh, I have a studio in the Northrop King building that I share with quite a few uh, North Star members. Um, Susan Fryer Boyd, uh, Saban Derberson, uh, Julian Midgold, um, Patty. There's, there's several people actually in my studio that I share um, that are part of the society. So I'm really excited about that. But um, back to this, the bag, you know, I got my mask, so when I forget my mask, we've all done that. Um, problem is I carry too much stuff. 
can carry all this stuff in here because it's all experiment, but really what you need is a paint kit, some type of brush, and a pen. <laughs> this is what you need. This is everything I carry. So uh, for better or worse, that's kind of how that works. So, um, And then as far as sketchbooks go, everybody ask about that. Um, over the years, I have tried so many. They're all good in their own ways, but this uh, handbook brand, and there's smaller ones too, they have about a, I would guess this is about a 90 pound paper, but it does really well with a lot of water. You know, you can see there's a little bit of bowling, but uh, who who cares on that? But lately, um, there's this Etcher brand sketchbook, and they're not the cheapest, but it's 100% cotton. Um, really loving these sketchbooks. Um, I like this horizontal format because I can I can do two squares. You just have a lot of options. But the most important thing is pick the biggest one that you can comfortably fit in your bag. Because if you don't have it with you, you won't do anything. So um, that's materials really quick. Um, I'm going to cover drawing a little bit. I keep looking at my watch to make sure I'm keeping time with where we should be. Um, but I am not super picky about pencils. I think the manufacturing quality and everything has gotten so good. But I usually keep like a B or 2B just to kind of sketch. Um, sketch, I'm not really particular because I'm not using right now a lot of lead in my work. Um, the other thing that I do use though is I go back and forth between um, a love of fountain pens and getting tired of messing with them. Right now, I'm not in a fountain pen kick, but I'm starting to itch to get that way again. Uh, I use the Stadler uh, Lumicolor. I don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, it's just basically a permanent, um, it's a permanent pen. And one of the things I do before I start sketching something complicated is, is I will generally do a super simple warm-up sketch just to kind of get your confidence up and just to just to break in. I mean, now we've started something, right? So that intimidation is, in theory, over. But I also carry a bunch of other kinds of pens. So, like, this is one of my favorites of a fountain pen that I do carry, but it's a Japanese feud pen let me see I'm backwards to the camera here but anyway it's got a bent nib to it um, and so if I'm straight up and down I get a really I get a really fine let me see if I can move this in closer I get a really fine line if I lay it flat I get a much larger line so I can get some really interesting lines with the same pen okay and that's nice. And I generally carry two of these. I carry two of each kinds of my pens, especially the watercolor or the fountain pens, because I will carry one that is very intentionally filled with waterproof ink. So I even label it here. It says this is a Noodler's Black waterproof. And so I know that this pen, once it's dry, and this is a brush pen, so it's it's like a nylon brush. Um, I know that this one is waterproof. And I also carry the same pen, and even when I carry my more traditional water uh, fountain pens, I will um, carry this one. This is, has Lamy ink in it that is not waterproof. So I'll just show you an experiment here. Um, let's just draw the same thing. Uh, this is a really cool ink because um, even after it dries, it'll it'll kick off like ink wash, but it, you get these yellows and blues, and you don't ever quite know when they're gonna do that. And one of the things about my architecture job during the day, I'm trying to keep a number of people going the same way and trying to eliminate surprises as much as you possibly can. And in my art, I love to set some rigor down and then uh, leave room for surprises. So um, I also carry, um, I use these water pens a lot that I talked about before. Um, but I also carry a couple travel brushes. Um, this one I got a wet paint, which is my favorite store. And, um, and I, I, on that blog post, I have the, the brands and stuff. But recently uh, I found a Rosemary. It's more of a dagger point and it's a lot of fun too. Um, and I've started to carry this collapsible cup with me, not to be confused with coffee. Um, it will, I hope I don't drink it during this. Uh, not great. so. So anyway, you can see where I've just spilled some water on this. And so this ink will actually give you some really cool stuff. All right, this ink is um, waterproof, so it, so it doesn't. 
And both of those things are great if you know they're going to happen. I did a commission once, and I have messed up and grabbed my non-waterproof pin because when you have the non-waterproof, that all this stuff will get in with your, like, I'm just doing the, the yellow here. Oops. You get where you can see both of these. But you see how this, you can see how the black ink gets in with the color. And if you know what's going to happen, it's pretty cool. If you don't know what's going to happen, it's uh, not cool. You know, so this is a much cleaner situation that we've got going here with with these two. But I generally, generally would like to, um, oh, I didn't mean that to be green. I thought I was grabbing my black. We'll just go with it. Part of my part of my method you'll notice that I did not um, show you any let me get this camera back right I'm filming with this camera and I'm filming my iPad my way so um, so I just move that down so you can see it a bit more but maybe I can pull up so you can see the process a little bit better um, you will notice I didn't show you an eraser I tend to I'm not saying not to use an eraser but I tend to um, I like to make a make a move, then you make the next move. And if that move is not what you expected it to be, that's just part of the game, um, and you just keep going. So like this, this green is actually looking pretty cool, and it's a surprise I wouldn't have done if I had pretended control to control everything. But I've got a whole day full of that, so I really love these little surprises that happen here. Um, so with that, what I thought I would do was um, I'm going to show you this photograph again. Let's see if this will work. Cool. It's a really slick program to be able to move this stuff around. This is the backyard. This is what I'm looking at, um, looking at right now. All right, good. That was the coffee. Um, I'm going to try to draw. Not going to try. I am going to draw. The biggest thing is to go into a painting with the attitude that you can do this. Um, I think about the uh, Stuart Smalley thing. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough, and I can do this painting. Um, you know, the trick to something like this is to figure out what you're not going to draw because there's a whole lot going on here. In my house, we're going to recite it uh, probably in the next year or two, do, try to do a passive house type thing. It's very, very dirty. So I have choices of, uh, of not painting the house as dirty as it is. Um, but with that, I thought I would just go ahead and give that a shot and just walk you through my process. And I'm going to do it two different ways. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time actually that didn't seem to dry very fast um, so I'm gonna go instead of the smaller sketchbooks which I would typically use right uh, actually let me get this back all right so instead of the sketchbooks that I would typically use um, which I certainly could do one that small or something else I'm gonna do something a little bit larger so we can see it so let me get the camera and everything set up what I want to do is you can be able to see the water and my paint kit and the paper so let me see How good I can do that. I'm gonna move this up a little bit. And all these toys. All right. All right. So we're we're about 18 minutes in. So I think that's good. Okay. So what I would typically do is I would a lot of times I will try to do something without the line work because I always know I can save it. So let me let me just come back and I'll show you something here. Um, let me find one. So this was a, um, my son was doing a mountain biking thing and I was um, just on the sidelines and there was this beautiful tree and kind of these trails and I was doing about five or six days at a time, not, not really worried about getting them right, but um, I was hoping for more definition in this, but I don't. But I didn't get it. But I always know that I can come back in. Here, I'm going to move this down again. I always know that I can come back in, and I'm a big fan of scribbling because I'm not trying to tell you that this is this perfect tree. I'm trying to tell you there's this yellow tree, and amongst all of this beautiful green stuff. Okay. 
you know, so I can kind of come back in and pick up some of this definition. I'm going to use the brush pen so you can see it a little bit. And I do my best not to treat these as precious because as soon as you... I've taught art for a while, six or seven years, and I've learned that most of the trick is to get out of your own way. Um, we all have this voice on your shoulder that's not your friend that's saying, well, is this good enough? And can I show this to anybody? And um, the trick to all this is to... Um, Shut that voice up. Um, there's Daniel, 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 Dan Gregory has a book. He wrote one about that called Shut Your Monkey. And it's it's really true. And so um, just treat these things as, as play. And that's one of the things about being in the sketchbook more so than, than elsewhere is things in a sketchbook, well, they're in a sketchbook. Not every drawing is, you know, not every single page is expected to be just fantastic, right? Uh, except in her own head. And then when you look at this stuff months later, you forget a lot of the the things you were trying to do. And I tend to like my stuff a lot more. Like I wasn't even happy enough with this to to sign it before. Um, but you tend to forget what you hated about it at the time. But we all feel that way. Um, commissions are especially tough, right? You get paid to do this thing and um, you've forgotten that they have hired you to paint like you already paint. But since it's commission, somebody's paying for it, you want to do the best thing you've ever done in your entire life. And you put all this pressure on it and it, you're, and they come out tight and they come out not having the joy that they hired you to do in the first place. Um, so I like to treat things like that as a gift to them, even if I'm getting paid and hopefully that joy comes out on the page. And um, then there's also kind of the snarky part of me when I start to get self-doubt. It's like, well, if I give somebody a gift and they don't like it, they're kind of a jerk, right? So uh, this is another, that same mountain biking path. Um, and actually this I like a lot more now than, than I did then. But if I started to come in and, you know, throw some definition of, um, of line work and stuff to it, I can kind of get to where, where I wasn't happy with. And actually I lost. I had some little people out here mountain biking. <laughs> and I, I lost them with just a paint because I was doing it super, super loose. Um, and there were people out here in the field teaching classes and and all this stuff. So, you know, you can always kind of come back with these and um, and get where you're get where you're going with the uh, with the line work. So for me, I always know that having a plan B helps me um, be confident with what I'm doing. So, so anyway. And that's just, you know, there's probably 60 lines there, and it really helped that quite a bit. If I spend another 15 minutes, it would be um, a lot better. All right, so from here, um, and it looks like I'm getting a bit of a shadow on things. That's the other thing about working outside is you uh, you have some other stuff to deal with that you don't typically that you don't typically have. So, um, so I think we're just going to have to live with it a little bit right now. Um, I'm wondering if I can. We'll lower this umbrella down if that'll make it better or worse. Doesn't seem to matter. Alright. The joy of the live demo, right? Okay. So what I'm gonna do is try try this again. So what you do when you have something big complex like this, you try to get the basic shapes. All right, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to come into this with a pencil. And like I said, I'm not super particular about my pencils. Um, but the first thing you do is you want to get it right sized. Um, I can actually pull this back a little bit. You want to get things sized on your paper. So you see people doing this kind of thing all the time. You know, you're, you're doing this. But the thing is, is this house is about um, twice as wide it's about one and a half tall. I realize you can't see this yet, but it'll make sense here in a little bit. And I'm doing a demo here. I would typically take a little bit more time, but, well, not a whole lot more time. Because it's not, it's not important to get everything right. I'm just trying to tell the story of this backyard, which is one of my favorite places. We worked really hard. Um, you can see we built this, this funky little... Um, and then we this, built this funky little tree house, and we got this is all raised bed gardens. Um, we eat most of our meals out here in the in the summertime, so it's just a really one of my more favorite places in the whole whole world. Um, I str 
I always try to have a, a hither, a tither, and a yawn up front, middle, and the back. And um, so I'm going to kind of draw this table that's, that I'm seeing in front of me just to kind of give some depth, but depth between here and there. And then I want to get this treehouse in there because we worked our butts off on this thing. So two architects can't build just a regular treehouse, right? Uh, I'm going to just move this back over so you can see uh, what I'm dealing with. Um, while I sketch here. Um, and so for this particular one, I think just so people can see a little bit better, I'm going to go ahead and do the ink. All right, and then we get a lot of veg vegetation. So all of the uh, flowers that you see in front of the treehouse, um, that is all the dirt from all the rain gardens. And I made a mound and I just threw tons and tons and tons and tons of sunflower or um, wildflower seeds. And it took them forever to come up. Um, but now they're all there, so it's finally doing what I wanted it to do. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to um, to the drawing itself. And the thing is, like when I first started, um, I made this really tall, but actually I need it to be somewhere closer to here. And I'm not going to erase all this stuff. Um, I am going to just keep moving. And actually when I um, do the do the ink, you're not tracing what you did before. You're actually drawing it a second time. And if you draw anything twice, you can make it better, right? Well, most times. Um, sometimes it was better the first time. So this is probably enough to kind of get going on my trees, just this really beautiful yellow up here. All right, so what I'm gonna do, all right, and I like to draw my little sketchbook. Let's just say here, my little kit and my water and my coffee, this right here, all right? And see, and also while we do this, I'm also checking, so the thing that we did earlier, so that's doing some cool stuff. Now, that's why I like to work at multiple things at the same time, so you can kind of check on them as they, as they go, speaking of coffee. All right, four drinks and I've gotten the same cup every time. So we're doing good. All right, so now the fun part. Um, what I will typically do, I probably should have done this beforehand, but I will go ahead and charge up my colors even though I'm not using all of them, right? Man, I really do need to fill these. So I've got my two yellows, um, uh, Hansa yellow medium, I've got this new Van Gogh, new gamboas that I love. I'm going to get these color names wrong because I mainly just read them. I never hear them say, say it out loud. Cerulean blue. This is ultramarine blue. Um, I love my thalo blues, although they're really strong by themselves. Uh, this titanium I have a love-hate relationship with. I keep trying to take it out of my palette, but I keep using it. Um, this is cad red, and um, I think there's a quin red in here. Uh, this this particular orange I really love because that. See if you can see that. Um, this orange and this blue, the phthalo blue, make the most beautiful black. Um, and I really dig that. Um, I'm gonna use some paper towels that I picked up from a restaurant. I also have a towel that I'm trying to start to use so we have less waste. But some habits die hard. Um, but that black that I just showed you, actually I will, from the tube, I pre-mix that and I put it here so that I always have it. Um, so like for instance, I'll just go ahead and put some down now. Um, this door is actually pretty black. And windows, amazingly, are black during the day. And at night you see them, you would think, if you're drawing what you think you should see, see and I completely forgot a window here. If you're drawing what you think you should see, you would draw them them light, right? Uh, since I've already got the black going, I'm going to go ahead and pick up some of this. We got this hole in there just so the kids could see through and shoot Nerf guns and that type of thing. This is weird doing a demo without an audience. Hopefully, it's cohesive enough. 
All right, and then um, this buff titanium is a really interesting color. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just do that because the house is a really dirty stucco. We'll see what it actually becomes. We're going to try to do the super thick insulation. Calculate it so you don't need heating or cooling except for extreme times. Um, and then sometimes you're just given colors, right? So the color of that tree, this is almost like just a pure game. New Gambo's color, but I want that to blend in with, um, it's probably too much, what I got here. And um, everybody knows you can pick up, right? You take a thirsty brush, which is something that's wet, you dry it off, and you can really pick stuff up. Uh, you can do it with paper towel too, but it's, it's just better if you let the stuff float around like it wants to. Then I'm gonna pick up some of this New Hansa yellow. And I'm just going. Uh, I am not overly worried about accuracy. Um, I'm just trying to tell the story here. And notice that I'm working around. Notice that I'm working around the drawing. I'm working around here. I'm working here. I'm working here. Just trying to keep everything up at the same time. Um, this guy is pretty close to just a the cerulean blue. I bet I'm saying that wrong. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit of red just so it's because there's no clouds up there at all and every time I do it I'm gonna change the mixture up a little bit like this time I'll put quite a bit more blue let's just kick some in here let's just see what happens that may not be a good move but it's too late now sometimes I re-wet I wet my paper first and sometimes I'll just go go at it like this um, I did a demo a few years ago and talking and uh, one of the people in the audience asked me at the end, do you feel like that's a good painting that you did? And, and I looked at it and I was thinking, well, for talking and doing it fast, um, yeah, so I was, I was perfectly happy with it and I looked at it a few years later, it was in my flat file, I was like, yeah, I can see where she asked that question. <laughs> so hopefully this one comes out a bit better than that, but the point here is just to tell the story, right? Um, and I wasn't offended by the question, but when I uh, saw the painting again, I was like, yep, that's why she has that. All right, and then um, I tend to, oh, this is a big deal for me. There's a lot of colors here, right? And too many colors, you get things muddy. So I would, in general, try to pick three or four that I'm gonna just use. So now that I've used the blue, I'm gonna try to stick with that to do, do my mixing. I'm gonna use both yellows. Um, and since I've used this red, I might stay with this cadmium red. Um, but th that generally keeps your stuff clean. And then you can you can break those rules all you want. They're your rules, right? This is the one place you get to make your decisions. Um, and so what I'm noticing is that uh, there's brick. That this brick is um, you can't see me pointing. The brick is kind of a orangish color, so I'm going to just kind of kick that into to here. You know, and I got going. I said I was going to do the ink first, and um, I just started going. So now I have passed that, so I won't be doing the ink first. Um, so forgive me, but the thing is, is once you start, once you start going, you just once I start going, we just kind of keep keep going, um, and most of the time it works out. Just kind of has a yellow. Actually, this piece, the tarp is actually an old painted canvas. You know, my kid and I have slept up there a couple times. All right, and then the fun part. So green. I for a long time did not carry any greens in my palette. I always mixed my own greens. But here lately, I've been carrying a thalo green and also a sap green. And then just throwing stuff to that to kind of keep um, to keep it clean. And this sap green is um, granulates quite a bit. And I, I think that's kind of cool. Um, but the thing about mixing your own greens, or even when you're using the other greens, is to mix it up. 
every time. So like this would be too strong by itself. All nature has a little bit of green in it. Um, sorry, all nature has a little bit of red in it. Um, whether it's dead grass or pine cones or buds. And it's easy to forget that. So if you're painting and you see that your um, that your greens look kind of neon and fake, um, kick just a little bit of red in it, and I mean just a little bit, and you'd be amazed. It just seems to they just seem to sing together. Um, so I'm just hinting at a bunch of vegetation, and this is where something I would come back later. And so notice that I've got some decent blue. I got quite a bit of yellow. And I'm not really showing the red very much in a way. Um, I like to try to show all three primaries. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this red. And my house has some red tint to it that desperately needs repainting. Um, so I am going to, I'm not gonna use the straight CAD red, but um, I'm gonna make it mostly red. I have other larger palettes that I work with too, but I, the point of this demo is to kind of show you what you can do in a very limited space. I do these kind of drawings in coffee shops and I kick my poor kitchen table. Um, let's, see, let's just catch quite a bit of this. Um, and so see, I've got red where I didn't need it to. That's just kind of an opportunity. Let's just bleed that all out. Um, And there will actually be the subtlest hints of red up into here. Actually, this might be a better thing to... I love flicking paint. It's so nervous, but it always works, and it never dries as drastic as you think it's going to, ever. So don't be afraid of it. Oops. Well, be a little bit afraid of it, but not all the way afraid of it. Let's kick up some more of this and that same orange that I had mixed up for the house behind me actually the shingles of my house they read a little bit red orange and then I almost forgot about my fence that we put in a few years ago it has made all the difference You might hear my neighbor next door. Good guy, but he's, you can generally hear him across the neighborhood. If you've ever been to Whitey's, he uh, he just sold them, but he's he owns Whitey's in Minneapolis and in Stillwater, good guy. All right. So at this point, this is something I would generally let dry a little bit. I'm hoping you can see it. Let me get it out of the, in the sun. So it doesn't look like much yet, but all these watercolor demos look like that, right? They look um, not fantastic <laughs> as they're going. And then at the end, they all kind of pop up. So I'm gonna go ahead and just throw some different colors on here. Um, and this is exactly why I like to draw, I like to do two at a time. Uh, timing wise, I think I'm sort of coming up. I'm, I'm gonna let this dry just a little bit as we go through. And sometimes to let things dry, especially in this type of painting, cause you don't always have a lot of time. I'll go ahead and pick up or let the brush soak up the standing water. It's also fun to let it move around a bit. Um, so with that, what I think I'll try to do is to do another smaller one where I will show you where I would, um, I would do the drawing first and I'm just going to go for it. Um, this would be a quicker, so that would be what I just did there. What I just did here would be if I had a lot of time, right? If I had like another 30 minutes to, to go over the top of this. Well, and I suppose with this video, I can change it up later. It's kind of nice to have these options. Um, but here, I would maybe just, um, oh, see, that's not the right angle, but it doesn't matter. You'll see, um, you'll see once we kind of get there. Um, 
So I'm just trying to tell the story about, hey, I'm doing this demo out with this great um, society. I'm going to pick up on this chair because the chair is white and that'll be a nice contrast and give me some foreground. Um, Somehow have watercolor. This table is a uh, porous, and I've got watercolor spilling onto my my pant leg. So, all part of the occupational hazards. So, uh, so there's a little fence here. We got a little tree house. Um, perspective is something I've taught a few classes on, but um, I'm kind of classically trained on perspective and I was sketching it all day so it's just a it's a practice thing um, so I'm, I've gotten okay at just doing that on the fly after years and years and years and years of practice um, all right so here's kind of a so what's nice about this is uh, when you're doing your drawings the thicker lines will pull things together so like this house if I make that a thicker line, it's going to really thick line. I like this chair needs its own thick line. This is how you kind of group things together. Right? So, and then I am actually going to ignore the fact that the house is back is back there. Just because there's there's enough going on in this small um, painting that it, that it doesn't help it or hurt it. Um, and this is that mound that I was just talking about, right? So, okay, so from here, so this would be the, the kind of the case. Oh, and there's also, um, we haven't had satellite TV in 10, 12 years, and so I am choosing to not paint that very deliberately. All right, so let me pull my stuff back in here. And then I will show you, uh, this time I'm going to use this different brush just to, uh, just because um, and so for this time I'm going to use a different combination of the red yellow blue so um, and I've gotten to know my palette well enough I know sometimes it comes out warm and sometimes cool um, but especially if you're like painting in the dark or with um, bad light you know let's say there's neon or something so this paint is bleeding a little bit but it's also just very wet and um, I'm going to decide that that's cool because it's already there. Alright, so this time I'm going to pre-wet the paper above all of this. Oh, cool, look at that. See, that's the kind of stuff that's it's pretty neat. And this ultramarine blue is really granulating, especially since I haven't mixed it very well. So we're just going to decide that that's part of it, too. You sort of get to decide what you're worried about, unlike everyday life, where it will often decide for you. So one of the things is called growing a wash, and so see I've, I've mixed this green, and so this time I'm going to make it quite a bit more blue, but you keep while it's still wet, and this time I'll make it quite a bit more yellow. And this time I'll just do straight blue. Oops. I have not been putting the red to it, so maybe now is the time to do that. As long as you're adding to it while it's still wet, um, it will grow and do all of these super cool things together. And it takes a little practice, but it's a really neat, um, it's a really neat effect. All right, so I'm coming up on about and see, I grabbed the wrong blue there, but who cares? Well, I get to decide if I care. And I don't. All right, so then I'm going to make a bit of a... an orange, let's just use... Ooh, it's pink. Let's just see what happens. Oh, that's kind of cool. All right. Let's just get some of that that duskiness. Do a tad more red and get the highlights on my house. It's not red enough, so we need to put more red to it. Oof, not that much. I also have a rule that I paint until I regret the last three moves. 
and, uh, and then I stop. But I'm not quite there yet, but we're getting close. Um, there we go. That's more the color that I was wanting, and also for the fence. And let's just say the tree, which we'll come back with some blue to to darken that up. And then the fun part, this super cool yellow tree. And I'm loading the brush up with water way more than the paper because I want I want this to bloom out. Um, did I just drop too much on there? Probably so, but it's sort of the point. You, sometimes you gotta decide what the point of the painting is, right? And one of the point of the paintings on this one is is that tree, which I need to show the camera because it's really got the sun coming through it now. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon and uh, water's starting to come. Ooh. All right, so since this black is a mix of this blue and this orange, um, I need to be careful because I just put that on the tree and that's like mixing five colors. Um, and try to get all of your colors with two when you're doing fast and loose like this. And if you, three is okay, but if you can get it with not more than three, it's generally not gonna be super muddy. So be careful about your pre colors like burnt sienna and stuff like that, um, which I love. But just know if you're already using two colors and then you throw that in, you know, you're throwing two to three or four colors in as well. So this one's kind of coming out cool. Um, I'm not quite ready for that to be pure white. Ooh. So that certainly bled out and I don't want that right now. So, so I might need to wait for that to dry a bit more. But you can pick stuff up as I just showed, even after it's, even after it's wet. Um, and then this might be fun to break the rule I just said, and I'm, I'm gonna use this sap green and, and just throw some color in. Let me, I can get a little closer. I love doing this when I'm teaching a class because uh, like people physically cringe, like, what are you doing? But it really does, it does add some magic. Um, I said I was gonna just use the three primaries, so let me use this coral pink a little bit and just throw this in. Because you see how it's all splotched up? It's not going to be, here, let me show you. It's not gonna stay that way. And actually you can start to drip the paint, which is really fun. At least it's something I consider fun. Um, so I like the splotches. And it's my painting, so I get to decide. is kind of this same color mixture that we had there. Um, this is another place you could do kind of a grill wash. Just throw some, some blue. So, so see how separated that is? That may or may not happen once it's actually done. So I call that letting the pigments hold their counsel. They'll make some cool decisions. Uh, like if this is too much water up here, you could just hold this in a second Sometimes some of these brushes, it takes like a second, but like in a second and a half, this stuff will start to just run up in there. So like if I had a ton of water like that and I dry the brush off, but not all the way. Yeah, see how that just sucks that right up. It's a really nice tool. And actually you can even pick it up. Kind of sweep it back in and then all this stuff will kind of resolve itself out. It's never the same shape that you uh, that you think it's going to be like that. Um, all right, so this one's kind of at a place where it's where it's cooked, uh, and we're at about 50 minutes. So I'm going to come back to this one now that it's um, 
Yeah, it's dry enough. Uh, different pins work better when they're um, at different levels of, of how dry they are. So this is actually still a little bit wet, so I'm trying to pay attention to what we've got going here. So, um, But now if I'll start to come in, and the paper is still a little bit wet, which is actually making some cool effects. Um, if I didn't like that, I would just wait a little bit or a hair dryer or kind of the rest of that stuff. But um, this one's I'm kind of digging it. And I can always come back on this and do a bit more um, shade and shadow and that that sort of a thing um, and then as I see things like um, I'm realizing that I didn't show the trim around I didn't show the red trim around these guys you know so I could start to come and put some of that stuff in as we go through and you can keep picking at things um, you know so let's show my Here's my sketch kit, my cup of water. And see, when you do the ink, you're not tracing, so I made that cup bigger. Um, my coffee cup, I'm also gonna make make bigger. Get my table going here. So here's that part at the end of the demo where things start to, to come together, hopefully. <laughs> You know, and, and things like this, you can always come back, um, you know, with a bit of a shadow to pop things, to pop things out and do things like that. So, so you almost dip my um, my fountain pen into the into the water. So see, I kind of lost my opening there, but but now we have it back. Things like this is a little climbing wall that we made him. And I'm not trying to be accurate, I'm just trying to tell a story. And so remember when you're drawing things, um, don't try, I'm not trying to make a beautiful picture here. I'm trying to tell the story of my backyard because if I think I'm trying to make a beautiful picture and I wonder if y'all like it uh, that voice on my shoulder is um, not your friend and it's going to wreck you right um, so like this tree has not had any definition here yet at all but now it's time to kind of give it some of that and I'm a big fan of scribble because your brain loves to make shapes um, of things You know, and I could always come back and do and do more and more of this. Um, I could hint at windows and stuff in the house. That's behind. It's all yellow now, but who cares? Um, I think it's actually kind of working for us. And then that mound that I'm talking about has all sorts of flowers to it that we really didn't do justice. Here's my barbecue. There has been a lot of a lot of food that came out of that that guy. And there's a chair over here. In the gardens, you know, so I could start to kind of piece out some of the garden stuff. And notice that the table is not coming as forward as I want it to. So if I make the line weight thicker, that should start to bring this stuff, this stuff forward. I'm hoping that this is making sense. But now that this is mostly dry, um, you can see that I've got some flowers and stuff on that mound. And I can come back with um, a bit more thicker paint and hit some areas. And then Ted Nuttall did a demo a long time ago for, for North Star. And he said, when you put colors down, just kind of throw them everywhere. And I thought, that's crazy. But man, it really works. I love, I love doing that. Um, let's see, I've got some oranges um, through here. And then those blacks that I was talking about, you know, that would be, now it's time to come back and get some of those back in. And I could just kind of keep playing with this and keep messing with this 
Um, paintings and drawings are never done. They're due. Uh, so at a certain point, you have to stop. And then my rule is I stop when I regret my last three moves or the last four or five moves don't add anything. So like right now, I feel like this is still adding to the story. But here in a second, I'm going to regret a move or two. Or it's just not going to like tell the story any better. And that's how I know that it's probably time. Um, it's time, time to move on. And the drawings that you hate that, um, that didn't do what you want, they're actually more valuable than, hey, there's another painting in my comfort zone. Uh, you actually learn more from the ones that you don't care for. And just kind of keep that in mind, too. Um, it's actually better to do a few that you hate and then and actually then look at them months later and you don't hate them as much or you show them to somebody else and they'll actually like the one that you like the least. Um, and it'll actually make you look at your own paintings uh, quite a bit different. So, um, you know, here I'm using some different colors that I wasn't using before, but this orange is in that black that I make and then I'm going to throw some water down. So anyway, I'll take some pictures of this once it's finished, but, um, you know, it's kind of getting there and, um, I'll take this out of my holder and you can see, and the lights even changed quite a bit since when I started this whole, well, whole thing. House hasn't gotten any cleaner, but the, um, but the light to that tree is just really something Look at that. Well, you can't see it now. So anyway, I think that wraps up my um, watercolor portion of this. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, here's the other piece. Let me let me back this up. You know, so in a matter of an hour, we did um, two two of these, and then also, you know, this is dried out really well too. I really recommend doing kind of a warm-up sketch. That's something you're comfortable with. Um, just get your juices flowing. And um, a lot of times, these are really fun. Um, I've sold several of these in the in the studio. So anyway, um, hope that was helpful. Um, at the end of this, we're going to do um, kind of question and answer, which we do live. And I've been able to, um, hopefully been able to uh, answer questions live through the chat as we went through. So anyway, thank you again for the opportunity. I love sharing this stuff. Um, shoot me any questions. Um, it's hard not to mess with it. I keep seeing stuff I want to do. Um, don't treat this stuff as sacred. Just uh, keep, just keep rolling with it and just experiment and have fun and just treat it like an ongoing process. Nobody paints like they want to paint. Everybody's kind of somewhere in their, in their middle. But give yourself permission to paint uh, like you do right now. So anyway, I hope that was good. And um, thank you for the opportunity again. So that's the, the video portion. Um, so these are the these are the final products. I thought I'd put them up big so that you could see um, see where those are. I was really tempted to go back and just you know get more and more detail and put things in, but um, you know I, I kind of wanted to show you what uh, what happens to it. And I do like this quite a bit more than when I uh, was finished with it because <laughs> I still had in my head what I wanted to go right. Let me show you this other one, the smaller one. Um, this over you know and at the end i like this one better than the large one and today i like the large one better than the smaller one and then um the coffee cups that green accident that happened in the beginning i really um uh, you know that's probably the cooler parts of this painting and that that happened because i let the uh, i call it letting the pigments hold their counsel and in some of my coffee cups if i spend more time this is a recent one um you know, if I spend a bit more time on it, um, sometimes it, sometimes I'm procrastinating doing the real painting, so I spend more time on the warm up. So, um, so with that, um, I guess I could, I'll put those links in the chat, but I'm I'm open to questions. I don't know if uh, how we moderate that, but um, but I hope that was helpful. Thank you, James. That was great. Um, I'd just like to say to everybody, I sent a message in chat that uh, anyone who has a question, just 
send it to Art or me, and then we will unmute you to ask your, you don't have to send us the question. You can just say, you have a question, and then we'll unmute you to ask the question. Um, James, I'm just wondering, do you then, um, do you ever go home with one of these quick sketches you've done? Do you ever go home then and do a formal painting of any of it or no? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, I have an example. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes they just stay as they are. And um, sometimes they, they live another life. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see if it's here. Uh, this particular one is very large. It's a full sheet. And um, I took a picture of that thing with my camera and trying to play with the depth and I did a small painting and it wouldn't let, it wouldn't leave me alone until I, um, until I painted it. Um, but most of the time they just are what they are. Um, they don't tend to, to go larger. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're studies. Um, it, it just really, I'm trying to think this this piece this is at Westminster in the permanent collection it's a full sheet it started as a small sketch that I did in church and I thought well what if I wrote you know what we say during the baptism and stuff to it and uh, and it came out decent well enough for the church to to pick it up so so yeah I'd say probably five percent of the time ten percent of the time okay great um Barb Parisian I'm going to ask you to unmute and she has a question for you, James. I like to sketch outdoors, but mm -hmm. uh, winter is coming and uh, I'll be inside of my house looking out of my windows yes. and everything I see, I'm so accustomed to and it just seems boring to me. Um, how do I motivate myself to uh, see things differently, you know, and be able to sketch looking out from sure. all of the hills of my house? Yeah, that is such a good question. Um, urban sketching doesn't mean outside. Um, so one, one thing to do is, so as an architect, um, I like to set, you know, when you're designing a building, you wonder, like, is anybody really going to pay attention to how careful we are to not let the stone, you know, hit the siding and there's just a little reveal? I like to sit and think about what the other architect thought, other designer thought, right? Um, and so sitting down and sketching is, is a way to do that. Um, anything you pick up was designed. Let's just say this is a bottle of ink. Somebody had to sit in a committee and decide that this one had a slope instead of straight. Um, everything that you could possibly pick up has, has a design piece to it. So maybe just pick something and just think about the decisions that were made on it. Like here's an example. This was in 2015, but just the Tabasco, you know. So maybe just kind of look at it like why is why is it this way? Um, um, but I guess for me it's like we go we go so fast, so much. The chance to just sit and look at something for 10 minutes, like just concentrate on one thing instead of just being bombarded from everything. Um, you know, this guy was at Dunn Brothers and had this really cool hat. And so, yeah, I just kind of spent a few minutes finding stuff. There's a quote, and I don't know who did it. Um, a lot of times if I'm stuck, I get stuck a lot, is um, find things that have a relationship and let them talk. Uh, one of my favorite sketches was done at an Arkansas version of a Waffle House called a Huddle House, uh, driving home with my parents. And there was a, there was a salt and pepper shaker you know, little glass ones, and they just seemed like they were having a conversation, so I did a little sketch of those. So, you know, maybe look for things that, you know, wonder why they were designed a certain way. Look at things that have a relationship, you know, this red cup, you know, the complimentary green. Just just find some little part of it and try to tell some little story. You know, it, it may mean 50,000 things, but pick one thing to kind of, to ramp up. Does that make sense? You know, like this, this was um, during a meal. And I just really loved how this barn was kind of offset. And um, so I just kind of played around, played around with that. 
there's different stories. I could have really emphasized the wood, but I didn't. I could have really picked up on the shade and shadow. Um, just find some little thing that you find interesting and amplify it. So James, uh, we have a question from Lynn uh, Middleton Kohler, who uh, basically had question about your abstract painting. She wanted to know um, a little bit more about your abstract work, what yeah. motivates you, what's the story that you're trying to accomplish with that work. So Lynn, uh, I don't know if I got all your questions, but please mm -hmm. unmute. Okay. Well, I think I can answer that from that. But... I maybe could tack on to that a little bit, Art. Um, sure. Yeah, I was really curious about how the abst how abstraction fits into your work, James. Yeah. And yeah. I'm noting, especially on the screen right now, I'm seeing um, that tree with the, it's almost like it's on a, like the sky and the green are, yeah, that one, they're mm -hmm. on a grid. And that, that also kind of goes in an abstract direction for me, but I, I'm curious, you know, with your love of storytelling and relationship and how does that, how does abstraction work into your, into your, into your work? Yeah, uh, awesome question. Um, and I've just found this other sketch. This was Cafe Du Monde. And I just loved how this white bird took off. So that's what I focused on. All right, so the abstraction. Um, a lot of times, okay, so this tree in particular, I love putting rigor into the sketch, right? So a lot of my stuff, um, Lars Laren is an amazing watercolorist. And I went to see his show at the Swedish Institute after about 30 people said, James, you gotta go see this. And it changed how I paint, but he has like a draftsman like quality with a really crazy loose execution. And I really love that. But I am a big believer in the golden mean, golden mean, uh, you know, the Vitruvian man. Um, I use it in architecture, I use it in my art. Um, and really, any proportion system works. It doesn't have that one's not magic, but your brain loves order, but doesn't have to understand it. So a lot of times I will lay down. Um, a lot of times I will lay down geometry first and then sketch over the top of them. So like James, I draw... can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah. Can you turn off your screen share and then your you'll be bigger on the screen so we can sure. see what you're holding up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there. Is this better? All right. Yep. I'm at the point now where I can draw upside down and backwards. But I like to start with some kind of a proportion system. And then I will build off of that. And so what you're seeing with that tree is, um, that was a terrible drawing. Um, but I like to start with the kind of an, some rules or some, ad, some, some rules to start with and then a loose execution on top. I'm gonna go back and show you that screen again. Um, and so here I really played it up. Like I, I really played that up. With that. Um, other times I have made about all the decisions I can make during the day. And I just want to paint, but I don't want to think. Um, so that one, this is a piece, this is a full sheet of watercolor paper. And this one third place at the at the Minnesota State Fair two or three years ago. I was just surprised to get in, but see that little sticker, that was pretty awesome. And I missed the email, so I didn't know that I wanted anything until I saw the piece. That was so cool. But this was after a long day. And I love to do the couple mental neutral sketches where I'll just I'll make a move. I made this big yellow move. Boom. Then I made another move. Then I respond to that. And then I started to add these squares. And then I just it's like you play a balance and proportion game, and then it becomes rules. So we've got to connect these and there's got to be dots. And you come up with four or five different rules, and you just basically keep going until it's full. You regret the last three moves, the last five moves don't do anything, and then you go away. And it looks like super planned out, right? Um, and these tend to um, to do pretty well as far as comments. Like I've heard everything. It's called City of Olives because people kept seeing olives here, which I was not thinking about. Uh, people kept seeing city plan, which I wasn't thinking about. Um, so for me, sometimes it's just set down a couple rules and just go and see what happens. And sometimes I cut the other series called Letting the Pigments Hold Their Counsel. Pulling stuff off my walls left and right. Um, with this one, let me, thanks for that tip. Let me share the screen here. Uh, I'll stop share. Sorry. Okay. So this piece, I will take watercolor, and it's a good way to learn your palette. 
and just load this up with water. I mean, like a pile of water before you go to bed so you can walk away and not mess with it. And then when you wake up in the morning, you, you kind of have this surprise, but this one actually came out to be pretty nice. Uh, anything that has a horizon, or horizontal line becomes a horizon, right? But those are really fun to do. And so, like when I said in my color palette, I'll use, usually just use three colors. It's a good way to learn which three colors will make a warm overall feel or a bright overall feel. Um, and then sometimes it's just, it's just playing. A lot of times, and I, I keep going back to this, um, if I have to do door hardware and deal with code issues and containment issues and city process stuff all day, I'll come home and I'll do these abstract stuff just because I love to watch the paint screw, you know, go around. If my day is pretty creative and I get the design, and which is a good portion of the days, that's when my stuff is a bit more uh, realistic. So uh, I saw a thing about um, Thomas Schaller, who I really, really admire. Uh, he, I saw a quote, he said, I like paintings that are about something instead of of something. And, um, I, and I like that, and I like that in my abstract too. But now nobody else knows that story, but um, they tend to, people tend to gravitate to them. So it's doing something right. Thank you. Marie Panliner, you had a question for James? I do. Hey, James, I think mm -hmm. I, I saw you do the demo a while back at North Star. And I think you said something about how to manage proportion when you're when you're sketching. Uh, I, I seem to have trouble with that, getting the proportion right on right. objects. Mm -hmm. Maybe could you tell us your hints on that? Yeah, let me see if I can find the thing about having piles and piles of sketchbooks is I can generally find um, an example. Um, but well, so the thing is, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that same trick again. Maybe I will draw this time. Just because something in front of you isn't proportioned correctly, doesn't mean that you can't make it proportion correctly, um, or at least have a proportion. So. If I'm doing this again, and if I've got a building, um, if I will take some time and actually turn it into, and I really can't even see this, so this is like blind upside down contour drawing. If I turn that into three squares, you know, three equal squares, and then sketch over that, I will start to get some of that proportion in. So a lot of times, I guess it's a long way of saying that I'll do a sketch of some geometry, and then, um, and I'll use and I'll use that, and it and it may go away, but but it has the tendency to have a better feel to it. Um, I had that Tabasco sketch, which I have flipped through a book. Uh, sometimes in my work, if you come to the studio and look through the, um, I, I have these just bins of non-frame stuff. Sometimes you can see the proportion work underneath them. This one you can just a little bit. Um, like for the grapes, I kind of drew the blob that I wanted first, and then I'm kind of breaking things into even thirds. And the other thing about drawing those squares on your page first, or drawing those divisions, once you get those squares on in that division, the page isn't blank anymore. Then you've started, right? A lot of times just drawing a border on your sheet, well, it'll make you, you you've started now. Because, you know, starting is a hard part. Starting and finishing, the middle part's fun, but starting like this one, I definitely laid out, uh, you know, I definitely laid out the proportions right before I started in on it. So, this is an architecture column in some little, I think it's Luton Resort. Does that help? That is good, thanks. Um, Any thoughts about how, how to uh, decide where the edge of your plain air painting is? For the edge. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> um, you want to decide it at the beginning. <laughs> um, because we have all done, we've all done this, right? If this is our, if this is our page. This is easier when I can see. So let's say that that's your page and you've got this bird that you really like the eye and the beak on. If you start drawing the eye and the beak first, and let's say you start with the eye, um, and you get the beak in, 
but your intention was to draw the whole bird, if you start with it, all of a sudden you don't have room for the rest of the bird on your page, right? Like that. So the trick to that is, especially when you see people doing this kind of stuff, is when you start, when you start on your page, you say, you know what, I want the bird to be about this big. And so you actually mark off where you want the bird. And then you get the oh. portion of the head to the body right. And then you get the tail right. And then you start on the beak and the eyes and stuff. And then you know everything's there. There's a concept called um, Bigra I use both in my art and architecture and my committee meetings of big rocks, medium rocks, small rocks. Mm, mm -hmm. And if you're drawing a bird or a room or anything, the big rocks are where that bird's at on the page. The big rock are its eyes, its body, and its tail. And if you get the big rocks right, then you move to the medium rocks. And that's the eyes and the wing and the feet, especially with urban sketching, because you're guaranteed a truck's going to pull in front of you, it's going to start to rain, the person's going to move away. If you can get the big rocks right, like you're drawing a person getting their head, their attitude to the people and the table right, they can leave and you can finish the rest, right? So get the big rocks in place. Then the medium rocks, like for that bird, would be like the wing and the tail and the feet. And then work on the small rocks, the, you know, the eyes and the, the, you know, the little details and the leaves on the branch that he's on. Work on that stuff until you either run out of time or it's enough to paint. So just start from big picture uh, to small, but plan the page for it. And once you draw a big rock, you know, that page isn't blank anymore. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. And I'll be in a committee talking about a building and there will always be somebody at the table we're talking about a room who wants to talk about what kind of doorknobs or what kind of cabinet <laughs> knobs we're going to have and we don't even know if we're going to have cabinet yet or not right but that doesn't mean that's not an important conversation it's just a small rock but let's talk about the big rock first what size is the room do we have cabinet do the cabinets have doors on them and then you get down to the small rocks but it's a way to tell somebody that that's important, but it's not time to talk about it right now. It's a way of telling your drawing, like, I know you want to draw the eye, but it's not time to do that. Gotcha. Thank you. To over answer that. <laughs> Judy Harvey, you have a question? <clears throat> Hi, James. Um, thanks for this uh, demonstration. I, you know, I'm a really methodical painter, and everything has to be exactly perfect and in line and all that kind of stuff. And I'm work, trying to work my way away from that, but it was great to see how um, most of your paintings are and the plan is. And so I learned a lot from that, but that's not my question. Okay. My question is, 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 what part of the painting makes you the most excited? Okay. The beginning, middle, end? Um, so one comment on your first thing, uh, after teaching for six <laughs> years, six, seven years, what I have learned is everybody that's tight wants to be loose. Everybody that's loose <laughs> wants to be tight. And as soon as you can get people, like give them permission to paint or draw like they want to paint, or if you want to experiment and be super loose, like I had these two guys that showed up and they were wood carvers and they do mechanical drafting and they really wanted to learn how to draw and be loose. And then they were fantastic at the end. But once it's like somebody had to give them permission. It's like the second grade teacher that told us all that our art was wrong. I guarantee you, she's not teaching it, and she's not going to show up and smack you, you know, smack your hand with it. Um, so kind of give yourself permission to draw like you draw right now. And but it's also a place to experiment. Like for me at work, I'm making $50,000 decisions that have to be left outside for 50 years and go through a committee and code and stuff. But with the art, it's a 25 cent decision. I don't have to show it to anybody if I don't want to. <laughs> so it's a good place to experiment. But for me, the, the most fun, exciting part is um, let me get this started. Um, is that middle part where the paint is doing whatever the paint wants to do? Um, can everybody see the video going here? So here in a second, when the purple comes in, I see this yellow. I'm going to touch some red, and it's accidentally going to see this. The blue moves around. Just like I'm making decisions and the paint's making decisions. That's my favorite part of it. Like we started. We've carved everything away so I can do some art. I'm not trying to finish it, but this part right here, when all the stuff is moving on its own, it's like teamwork. I'm doing something and it's doing something. That's my that's my favorite part. And actually picking it up from the framers, that's pretty fun. <laughs> it's an expensive part, but it's the fun part. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Th
you know, this was loose enough that it was also fun to, and I picked it up from that Lars Laring thing. Um, he just, he, these huge sheets of paper, lots of water, just letting that stuff run. And if you let the stuff run and don't smash it in, it'll float and mingle and do just wonderful things. But if you try to control it without giving it some control, it just, it gets muddy. And it's just a straight technical exercise at that point. All right. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just really fun to, to do this. And in that particular piece, um, is this, uh, let's see, this one. This is a four foot long drawing. I've done two of those mm -hmm. and they both sold. So that's been super nice. And one was in the state fair last year. I missed the deadline this year by one day, which is not uncommon for me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Oh. That was fun. Thank you. Do we have time for one more art? How are we doing on time? Yeah, we have time for maybe even two questions. OK. Patty Schmidt has a question for you, James. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can um, talk about what's your thought process when you compose a painting. It, what uh, what elements are foremost in your mind? Is it the shape, the values, the color, mm -hmm. uh, the perspective, where the light's coming from? What what do you think about first? What I okay, good 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 quotes good question. Well, you know, of course, it's different every time, right? But what I try to do every time is to think about what story, what what am I trying to say? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, especially when you're doing small and fast. You know, you've only got so many moves. Um, so, and then if I was to put this tree off to one side or whatever, so first off, I try to decide what story am I doing? You know, that, that find things that have a relationship and let them talk. Um, that's probably my first thing. And then my second thing is probably the proportion, that whole thing about getting um, the big rocks in place. Mm -hmm. um, that I guess, I guess proportion would be next. And then from there, it's it's contrast and depth. I don't know if you caught in that that video where um, I had talked about. Um, well, here's here's another example. Somebody had asked about laying out proportions earlier. Here's one where you can kind of see it, like I drew a line oh, yeah. Yeah. And, got, and got the pieces. Um, that stuff's important uh, to me. But the depth part, uh, somebody, and I don't know who it is. I wish I had made it up, but I always try to have a hither, a tither, and a yawn, which is an up close. I'm trying to find a good example. Um, an up close a background or up close a middle in the back like this particular one was painted in church mm. but um it doesn't have a very good foreground but it's got a good middle in the back and so i'm always paying attention to depth um but i'm gonna give myself a reprieve here because the lighting in that church is terrible so i don't know ever exactly know what it's going to look like until i get outside in the, in the daylight <laughs> um but like the backyard painting that i just did the only reason I put that table in was to give myself some foreground depth. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I generally try to do that and you can do that with line weight. You know, the heavier lines come forward. You can certainly do it with color. You can do it with detail too. A lot of times if I try to paint first and my hope is always I can paint and not have to resort to the line work. But mm -hmm. my plan B is something I really enjoy. So it's kind of a win-win. That's how you get your head tricked into I actually can do this. <clears throat> But so a lot of times the trees in the background, I won't put any line work to them because that gives you some automatic, you know, that, that depth of loss of focus. Mm. Um, so long answer, but stories first, uh, then proportion and relationships, architecture and arts, and it's all about relationships, right? There's a very intentional uh, relationship between the bathroom and the hallway, right? In a way that uh, <laughs> your bathroom and your dining room might have a different relationship. So there's an architect, he said, I can design a house that can make you get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> um, but everything's about relationships shapes colors um well i just pick three colors when i start because i know they're going to have a relationship even your mistakes work and then they're your rules to break as much as you want to yeah great thank you um luann hoppy isn't here i'm not sure she was here earlier but she had sent me a question she wants to know why you so often paint pictures of yellow pencils yeah <laughs> get that a lot. I do paint a lot of them. Um, and the reason is, is because I love pencils. And it's also a good warm up sketch. Like here's one that I haven't put line work to that I might actually not. It's kind of cool. But 
the reason I love them is um, that that painting I showed you that had the, olive, the city of olives, that painting taught me to not name my, um, give my things titles that would lead somebody's narration, you know, what they see in the painting. Because a lot of times it's better and deeper than what I thought about. And I just love to hear it. Um, when I had my own studio, I, and I wouldn't wear a name tag or anything because I just like to hear what people said. And I got a thick skin. Um, but I love the pencils because they mean so many different things to so many different people. Uh, let me share the screen on that one again. Um, but my favorite story that has ever come out, you know, people say education, people say um, art, they say, oh, it's because you're an architect. Um, my favorite one ever is this older guy came and said, oh, I love this because it reminds me of the love letters I used to write because I would write them in pencil in case I needed to change them. <laughs> I just thought that was great. But also, like, I sharpen my pencils with a, with a knife because they last forever if you do that. It's fun to do. It's an excuse to carry a pocket knife. But um, I just really love drawing pencils, and, um, and people seem to respond to them really well. And, and as a demo, they're really easy to, I can draw, I can draw a pencil in my sleep at this point. So as a demo, it's something I know is going to come out well, and it has a lot of story, and there's a lot of technical parts to it. Like this, if you were to cut this down, here, let me see if I can do this. Um, forgive me, because I'm drawing with the mouse, but um, this pencil is actually, uh, let's see if we can see this. It's actually perfectly... In the beginning, it's actually perfectly proportioned all the way down to these little dudes right here. So it looks it looks fairly random, um, but it's not. So if I was to do that golden mean is where you find the center, you go up here and you find the rotation. That's where all it. So all these things are placed for some reason, and then when the with the sketch and with the paint, I could be just like super loose. Um, so that's kind of what I'm about with that stuff. On that pencil that you're showing right there, did you do the white lines by lifting or did you mask that or did you just leave it white? How did no, you I'm not patient enough for masking. And when I have used masking, I, the edges and stuff I don't I don't care for. So I was just kind of conscious to um, to leave the paper dry. Okay. Uh, if you all heard the concept of paper being dead or alive, if the paper is uh, dry, it's dead. If the paper has any moisture at all, stuff is still moving. But if it's dead, it's like masking. I mean, it, it, you have to have a lot of force to have it jump. So a lot of times I'll just keep that part of the paper dry. Sometimes I'll trace it lightly with a pencil to remind myself where to keep it. Okay. Keep it dry. But like, unless you like force water into it, uh, it'll do it. So I have masking and I play with it every once in a while. The best masking accident that ever happened though was uh, I put a lot of masking down and then I was impatient and I've painted and the paint got mixed in with the masking. And then when I peeled it up, it was the coolest effect. Um, I've never been able to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> A happy happy accident, right? Yeah, yeah the whole Bob Ross thing. Yeah, right. I should do a reverse Bob Ross. I should let this get all bushy and do a reverse Bob Ross instead of being up on time. And Art, I think you had a couple of questions. Did you want to ask one? Yep. I, uh... I have uh, actually. I'm sort of curious if you've ever um, used a, a brush to draw with. I'm thinking of bigger pieces, maybe a squib yeah. brush or a smaller brush. Yeah, absolutely. I do um, all the time. And actually, one of my favorite brushes. Actually, that second drawing was done with a combination ink brush, and it's on that that blog site uh, that I said. But it's basically a um, it's basically a brush. Uh, okay. Ink, I'm probably flicking, but um, the other travel one that I carry, um, they don't make it anymore because I guess it had some quality issues, but mine doesn't. Is you know these little bitty travel ones that you flip out. It, oh yeah. It's really hard to get back in. But see that that crazy taper. That's a good one to draw with. But I love drawing with a. I love drawing with a um, brush. Because uh, then you can soften the edges, you can keep them hard. Um, yeah, I love doing that. I kind and, of forgot about it. I need to do it again. But this thing is so hard to get back into the container. It's because there's so many strands that can go wrong. 
And and we have a question from Barb uh, Carriger, who's one of our board members. I don't know if Barb is on yeah, the- Let me see if she's still here. Barb, if you, there you go. Uh, I think you've answered some of the questions, but uh, I was going to ask if you normally started your sketches with the uh, pen or graphite, soluble graphite, but obviously demo did one of each, uh, watercolor first. Which do you prefer? Well, that depends on time. If I have, um, if I've got three to five or 10 minutes, I'll do the pen, I'll do the pen first. Because then I can always go back. <clears throat> um, and then once the paper's wet, it doesn't do the pen very well. If I've got 30 minutes to an hour or whatever, um, I will sometimes do uh, paint and then pen or pencil and then, then pen. And also depending on how complicated it is too, right? If it's really complicated, like that backyard, the reason I picked it is because it's a really hard thing to paint. I, that's my second attempt at it. Um, with a pencil, you're basically drawing it twice, right? You get the pencil, you can kind of draw it, and then you come back with the pen, you're drawing it a second time, uh, but with, with more information. And then I do the, you know, then I can do the paint. But if I have a lot of time, I'll try to do it with the paint first and drawing with the with the brush like Art was talking about and just keep and keep working it. And then a lot of times I don't have to come in with a pen. Um, but if, I, if it's a quick, you know, if, it, if it's a cup of coffee's worth of a sketch, usually it's pen, quick, and then um, the paint. Because if you, if you get the pen down, you get the paint, and it's time to leave. I walk out of a lot of restaurants and coffee shops with my, with my, uh, with my finger in my sketchbook, drying, <laughs> drying as I go. So, um, you know, but I love all of it. I really love the, I love to draw, and I, I like how the, the pen really kicks things out. And a lot of times I'll do um, I'll do paint splotches down. Like I hate throwing this stuff away. You know the extra stuff that's in the the edge of your thing. A lot of times I'll throw that down on a page, and then a month later draw over the top of it. I don't know if I've got an example in here. You know, but something like this would make a pretty decent building sketch. But this is just not wanting to throw that stuff away and throw it down. And sometimes they're cool. Um, but I have a lot of those. Like one time it was a bunch of just stripes and they look like fish and there's gonna be these little cool fish with unexpected color to them. And our, this would be one that um, painted over something I did before, but using the paint, you know, more as a pencil yep. and then a paintbrush. Your work, your work reminds me of um, two British artists that I've followed over the years, Edward Wesson, who some of his earlier urban work was done using pen and ink as well as watercolor, and John mm -hmm. Hoare, H-O-A-R. Um, they're really great British watercolorists, so you should check into those if you haven't already. Oh, I just wrote them down. I think you maybe told me one of those guys before. Um, yeah, Weston is particularly good. Okay. I'll do that right when I'm done here. Um, James, does anyone else in your family sketch with you? Oh man, uh, yes. My wife is an, also an architect and artist, and my son draws quite well. And so a lot of these um, paintings that I showed you here, a lot of those were everybody's got their paint kit out and they're they're doing their thing. So um, I almost put a picture of that on the blog, but I couldn't quite find one. What a fun activity for a family! Oh, I just love it. It just because if <laughs> if they didn't have that kind of patience, right? It would. It was tough, but here's a trick. If you are with somebody that does not have patience for you to, to set and paint, what you do is you take a full sheet and you break it into grids. And you do a little painting of breakfast, a little painting of getting on the plane. You do little five minute paintings. Because if you're with somebody that won't let you paint for five minutes, you probably shouldn't be traveling with them, right? Yeah. But then at the end of the day, you've got this little page with these 10 or 12 little simple, just telling the story things. And that's really, that's really fun. Uh, the thing about not wasting that paint. So this is one that I had just thrown a red stripe down at one point. And I was in the airport waiting for a plane and I just sketched over the top of it, kind of ignored it, pretend it wasn't there. That kind of stuff's fun. And I usually do that way deep into a new sketchbook. Um, well, here's, here's an example of one that I did the watercolor first. 
This was out of a hotel room in Philadelphia, but I couldn't quite get the definition and I ran out of time, so I just hit it with a pen. You can always go back with a pen. So, so if if we want to, if one of us wants to join Urban Sketchers, uh, they have a website, I presume, correct? Yeah, there's tons. So Urban Sketchers is an international movement. So you can see sketches in Sao Paulo, you can see sketches in Canada or a foreign country like Texas or something like that. Um, but there are groups here. There's a, on Facebook, there's Twin Cities Urban Sketchers and uh, they meet like, well, when COVID gets done, they meet like once a month and once every two weeks. And it's a really supportive group. They meet like at Lakewood Cemetery, sketch for an hour or two, meet, you know, you look at each other's paint kits and stuff. But there's also Metro Sketchers, which meets at a place, but it's not solely Urban Sketchers based. There's underground artist league where they just meet at a coffee shop and just sketch whatever they want because they don't want definitions. But it's all the same 30 or 40 people. So, <laughs> so you could probably meet with somebody every other weekend. Yeah. And it's it's really fantastic. They're great people. Uh, nobody's hard, you know. Wonder what I could say, but everybody's nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and supportive. There's and what's a, what's fun about it is some people are great at buildings. Yeah. And suck at buildings or great at people and suck at buildings. Some people are great at vegetation. Everybody's good at something different. And so it's a good place to not feel like just out of your league. I'm sorry, DJ, I cut you off. No, I interrupted you. There's a Facebook group called Sketchbook School. It's Sketchbook and then School is S K O O L. And they offer online classes. I've taken a couple of classes from them, but I think they started possibly as an urban sketchers group. I can't remember the name. His name is right on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, but there are probably other Facebook groups for it also. What's so great about this Zoom meeting thing? I can do things we couldn't do before. So here's the Twin Cities urban sketchers. And here's the people um, that meet. And this guy is amazing, super nice. And his, his son sketches with him. Uh, so my kid has done it a few times too, but You'll see there's different quality all over the map. You know, this is a person who has a non-waterproof pen and it works. Like I said, that stuff's cool if you know it's gonna happen. Um, you know, so just little, oh. little stuff. So, oh. you know, not not trying to be over technical here, but tell that story really well, right? It's called seeing the world one sketch at a time. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be color. That's, that's marker. Um, you can use any medium. You just don't tend to see a lot of uh, pastels or oils just because they don't travel very well, but you absolutely could. So, a lot of people do journaling with it too. You very, know. very, very similar. Um, yeah. There's a Daniel Gregory book has a has a urban that's, sketches book. But that's the sketches. guy I was trying to think of. Yeah, he does the sketchbook school thing. Um, and our own Ross Stendhal, she's done a couple of those classes in there too. Um, the first time I ever saw this is that we did a semester in Rome and I've got four books from that. But I bought this book um, in Italy in 99 because we had to get home for Y2K, Y2K end of the world. And um, I just saw this stuff. You find a good example. And it just, I was like, there's no way, you know, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do um, to do this and I'm probably I'm probably as close as I've ever been. <laughs> yeah, but some of it, but some of it doesn't have to be complicated. If you look at that. You can't see how the green just shimmers, but um, I think I should probably do the unscreen share thing again. But um, you know, so this is how I wanted to sketch. You know, this is how I wanted to sketch. Let me get the well, page. And now that I'm Getting closer. Uh, where to go? Yeah, now that I'm getting closer. Wow. I probably could if I took one for a minute. But now, what I want to do, you, you never paint as good as you want to, right? Now, I would love to be able to paint like this guy. Yeah. This yeah. Guy, just the next with Thomas Schaller and. Uh, He's a good educator and stuff too, but I mean, it's just, that's a story right there. I mean, it's just, he's best to be wow. um, 
You just, I'm just flipping stuff open at random, but come on. Yeah. We all want to be better. Amazing. Well, I think we're just about out of time, but this has really been wonderful, James. I, very enlightening and it really makes me at least want to sketch more and and try different things. Um, and it sounds like you are really into experimenting with different techniques and different methodologies in your sketching and in, and in your painting as well. Thank there you. Is really one, one more question that came in, if I can ask it quickly. Someone, Linda said, I feel a certain sadness that the sketchbooks <laughs> end up on shelves. How do I get past that? Yeah, I know. Um, that is a, that's a problem, right? Um, but then, like, they sort of have a story because they're chronological. I used to travel to Philadelphia a lot. I did work with Urban Outfitters and Free People and Anthropology, and I got to go to all these awesome places and sketch, and they're kind of important. So my answer lately, and I didn't used to frame as much stuff as I do now, but my stuff, my answer lately is um, I have a smaller box like this, too, but I am pre-cutting out smaller sheets, you know, with kind of the sizes on. And then they don't feel so much like a like something that has to stay. And if I do a five by seven, it will actually, I think they fall out because I'm doing this demo, but they'll actually tuck into the back of the book, you know, as part of it. Um, and also those sketchbooks that have the binders, uh, the little ring binders, you can pull those apart and put different pages in them and you can take pages out, pages in. But yeah, I completely, completely feel, um, feel it. But the other thing about it is it, it's not quick and accessible. Like if you want to learn how to play guitar and you have to get the car, guitar out of the case every time you're going to practice, you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. With a sketchbook like this, um, you could keep in your pocket or in your bag or whatever, and you'll tend to do more. Uh, sketch like my kid was doing a little tennis lesson at Reed Sweat a long time ago, so I just did this little quick thing. Uh, so there's a convenience thing of just just doing it. But there's a whole story in this in this little book. You know, this is a cobblestone cafe there in White Bear. You know, that's I can remember being there. I've forgotten about it, but um, yeah, that's a really hard question uh, that I struggle with. Yeah, what are we gonna do with these things? You know, you can't it's, sell one of these. And... It's like a photo album, though. Mm -hmm. You know, what do we do with photo albums? Right. We cherish them. A lot of people say that'd be the first thing they grab if they had to get out of their house for an emergency. If, if you're sketching on a trip, and it sounds like you've done a lot of that, you're probably going to remember a lot more details and more experiences on that trip by, by just doing the sketch as opposed to taking a photograph. Yeah, Art, on that, um, that Rome trip, that's where I proposed to my wife that we were there for a full semester. We had tubware boxes full of pictures. Of course, we're both architects, students. there's no people in them, it's just buildings. But we've got, <laughs> since 1999, we've gotten those out twice and look at them. But those four sketchbooks that I've got, and Marcy's sketchbook that she has, I've looked at those all the time. Wonderful. And I can still feel it. There's one morning and I got up and I, the whole thing about sketching a coffee cup or something first, I didn't do that and I wasn't as prolific as I am now. And I got up, it was the last morning in Venice, I tried to do a whole scene and the painting was really frustrating and not very good. And I was just really frustrated with it. But when I look at it now, I can almost smell being there. Like I love that painting because now I think about it now, like I've got goosebumps thinking about it. I mean, I feel like I'm there again. And that's why we just don't stop now and, and look at something for 20 or 30 minutes. Right. Not why it yep. is. And that's what I like about this. It makes me do that. And as an architect, it also, it's like learning, even if you're not a big Beatles fan, guitarist will learn Beatles licks just to kind of figure out how they broke things down. It's like looking at art that you may not like, but you know, how do they pair their greens with their oranges or, you know, it all comes back out with your own vibe to it. Well, thank you very much. I think I'm going to ask anybody who's left to unmute so we can give James a round of applause. Well, thank you. And James, sure. be sure to read the comments. There's some uh, wonderful comments here at the end for you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun.
Thank you, everyone. We'll see you Thank next you. month. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank, Thank you, Art. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of people think you're very inspiring, James, as I do as well. Thank you. You know, and I you're wonder. Very, what... very approachable. You know, you you talk like a real person. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, in architecture school, they do a lot of crits, right? And they're just just beating people down. And um, you do that yourself already <laughs> with art. Um, so I, don't, I just love it. It's, it's the thing that keeps me sane. So. Well, I think a lot of us, I mean, a lot of the comments people made were, um, oh, I'm going to definitely try this. So I think you've inspired a lot of us to try something we might not have cool. thought of before. Well, cool. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.